Well, this morning we're going to talk about pitcher plants and uh, pitcher plants are, are really one of the most interesting of our native plants. They occur in North Carolina down at the coast as well as a couple uh, up in the mountains. But generally they're coastal plants. They run generally all around the Gulf Coast. There's only one species native further north and that is Saracenia purpurea and you can find that all the way up to Canada. So that's certainly the most cold hardy. But all of them are good to at least zero and most of them down to at least minus 20. Saracenias are a plant that like it moist but not particularly wet and that's where a lot of people make a mistake is they try to keep them too wet. I know when we first tried we kept ours we thought they were bog plants and kept them in the bog and killed them all. What they like are moist toes and dry ankles. So if, if you were to, to look down the roots always need to stay moist and that would be six inches down in the ground but their ankles right here at the base actually likes to dry out. So if you go in a bog in the middle of summertime it actually is crunchy. It's so dry on the top but if you dig down about six inches you'll always find moisture. So they are tolerant of, of droughts short term just not extended droughts. So what we've done in this case is we came in and put in a liner and we filled it full of nothing but peat moss. And the liner is probably about a foot deep. What you want to be sure of is that the liner, however, does not come all the way to the top because if it does, then they stay waterlogged. So we actually stopped the liner about two inches below ground level so that they always can keep their ankles dry. That's the key. So if you use a, a tub like a little uh, uh, artificial swimming pool, bury that below and then plant the plants about two inches above it. That's the key. You can also drill holes in the side if you're planting them in a container about two inches below the surface and that's the key to getting them to survive. Now they're fairly evergreen. We call them semi-evergreen because they're they look pretty good till about February and then they start getting a little ragged. We go in in spring cut all the old pitchers to the ground which the time look, look really rough and what you're seeing now is flowering season and most people have never seen Saracenia's flower and that's generally because they don't grow them in enough sunlight. These really prefer bright sun to flower well. You see how many flowers are on these. And the flower colors range from reds to pinks to yellows, uh, some into the, uh, the cream and even oranges. You can see uh, up here, this is uh, just finishing now. This is uh, Saracenia Flava, which looks really, really nice. And so the parts of the flower, let me grab a flower here. Mm -mm -mm. So the petals are the first thing to fall, so that's the flower. So once the petals fall, which you can see on the one up there, you can look underneath it and see all the pollen, loads of pollen. And the pollen is dropped right in here so the bee can get in there and do, go around and then pollinate. And then what happens once it finishes, right in the middle of the pollen, this little round thing, that's going to be the developing seed. And the cool thing about Saracenias is it drops the seed in this cup and they'll stay in the cup till you're ready to gather them. So Saracenia seed like to be sown very fresh. You do not want to let these dry out. If you sow them fresh, they'll be up in a couple of months. And very easy from seed. You can generally flower them in about two to three years from seed. You can also divide Saracenias. They're very easy to divide. So if we were to go in, and they basically have a stem that runs right along the base of the ground. So we could simply go in, if we wanted to divide, and take a knife and just go in here and cut right at the base. So let's go. There's a new Saracenia. It's, it's that simple. And so you can pot that up or plant that directly in the ground. So we're just going to go right here. And I'm going to cut the flowers off so they don't take a lot of energy from the... Now here are the developing pitchers. And that's where it gets its uh, photosynthesis from. So I actually prefer to leave those. But we're going to get rid of the flowers. And we're just going to plant that right back like that. And it's good to go. And that'll start growing. 
So they're extremely easy. You can divide them really any time of year. We haven't found a, a bad time yet. What they do not like is, uh, is chemical fertilizers. So lose the chemical fertilizers. This is never gets any nutrition. Where they develop to grow is in very poor soils down at the coast. And the way they work is they have an attractant to insects. And of course the two pitchers are full of water and they add their little chemical to it and when the flies crawl down in here they can't get back out and they basically drown and the plant dissolves the uh, insect tissue and gets its fertilizer from that. So they actually feed on the insects and then when a pitcher gets completely full of insects it will just fall over and die away and then the new ones come. And that's how it uh, is able to maintain itself in very, very poor soils. Uh, we've also found that they grow very well in non-bogs. Uh, if, uh, if you walk around today on the uh, full sun garden next door, you will see we plant them in normal garden soil, the same as we plant our agaves in, exactly the same. Uh, the pH is, uh, normally, let me back up, they normally grow in a pH around four to four and a half. Very, very acidic. We're growing them at a pH of six and a half, which is a hundred times as alkaline as they're used to. They grow absolutely great. No bog at all. No liner, no nothing. As long as you've got an area that stays slightly moist. That's the only key. So these have potential to be used as bedding plants. Uh, we actually have an area right outside our exit gate that we've planted. We want to use them as a bedding scheme. So if you have an area that simply stays moist, as long as you lose the chemical fertilizers, they're absolutely fine. So they're much easier to grow than people give them credit for. Everybody's, you see these long treatises of this is what you have to do to grow them, and it's just not that hard. So people are always surprised at how easy these are to grow. Now, pitchers range from very short to very tall. Uh, this particular one, the red bug, this has got a lot of Saracenia ruber in it. There's about, depending on your taxonomist, around eight, nine species. That never gets any taller than that. But things like the white top pitcher, they can get up to three feet tall. So if you come back in summer when these are finished flowering, you'll really see the pitchers begin. See, they're just starting. So pitchers typically emerge almost alongside the flowers. So the diversity of color in the flowering is just amazing. Now, this is very interesting. This is uh, the white top pitcher. Now, normally, white top pitcher always has red flowers. So here's, this is the normal white top pitcher. That's the flowers. This is an albino. So what that means is typically this one, you see the red veins in the pitcher? This one has no red veins. And because it had no red pigment, which is called anthocyanin, the flowers are all yellow. So that's a classic albino. But these by the end of summer will get up about this tall. And they really need no maintenance. It's, it's one of those plants that as long as you've got a moist site, they're so incredibly easy to grow. These tall ones are not, uh, not really affected by uh, strong winds? No, not at all. Uh, tough, in, tough to stand on their yes, with, with any plant, the, the key is good air movement. Uh, the way plants work, the stem cells strengthen themselves in wind. So as long as you've got good wind, those stems will be very sturdy. Now, if you've got an area and you've protected it from all wind and then you get a gust, yes, it's going over. So that's the key on everything. You got to let those cells exercise. It's just like humans. If you don't exercise the cells in your arm, your muscles will atrophy. Same with plants. So the key is that moisture. Now, I said they prefer full sun. In the wild, you'll find them growing in shade. Not a problem. They, they actually do grow there. They don't grow as well, they don't grow as nice, they don't flower very well. So if you want really nice looking pitchers, grow them at least half a day sun. So six hours is absolutely ideal. But they, as you can see here, these have only been in for uh, probably two years now, maybe a couple of them three years. So they grow extremely fast. 
and they're just divide them when you have a large quantity. Yes, we we're just showing very easy to divide, uh, and we were just uh, we were just uh, you just basically take a knife mm -hmm. and just come in and uh, I'll do one more in case anybody else wasn't here. So we're just going in like that. That's it. It's almost like ours. Just divide it. Yep. So I'm on. I was telling them I'm going to get the uh, flower off, leave the pitcher because that's where the new growth comes from, and just simply replant it. That's it. So and you did, you, and you didn't squash it down either. The dirt. Well, yeah, a little bit, but yeah, it, it, this is uh, because this is planted in pure peat moss. There's not really a lot of squishing you can do. Peat moss doesn't really compact. But that's it. Now I would water that. But it's that simple. It's not, uh, as I was telling them, people try to make pitcher plant growing very difficult, and it's not. It, it's, it's about as simple a plant as you could ever grow. So as long as you have a site that below ground stays moist, that is the key. So not too wet, plenty of sun, and no chemical fertilizers at all, zero. They do not like chemical fertilizers. Now, if you, if you want to put a little plant tone or something organic on it, great, great. Certainly don't mind that. But you got to keep, uh, again, the myth about pH is sort of a myth. <laughs> you really don't need to keep it that low. So if we find if you got it anywhere between four and six and a half, you're absolutely fine. Any other questions? So do you have to replenish the peat? I mean, do you like mulch these like you do a... Uh, you don't have to replenish. Peat really doesn't go anywhere. Peat is unlike compost, which continues to decompose. Peat moss is completely finished decomposing. There's nothing to decompose left. It's, it's, it's gone. So uh, it's there forever. Now, if you just want to make it look nice, uh, we did in our bog down here, we just, for appearance sake, spread a thin layer of peat moss out. But that's simply for appearance. The plants don't care. Yes, question? I'm in Ohio and I have, I've had a lot yeah. of success, but yeah. the, you, when you come in and cut them, do you like cut them by hand? I never usually end up yeah. cutting them and they do kind of look kind of crappy. Yeah, we come in with just a hand clippers. Hand clipper. uh, we generally do it around mid-March and just clip them right off at the ground. It's very simple and it makes them look so much nicer yeah. to not have that old right. dead foliage from winter. Can you tell us if, um, if you have yeah. a small pitcher plant here? How big should a pot be to emulate what's in nature? Uh, good question. The uh, we typically grow ours for sale in quart pots, but I would put them in. Uh, you know, if I bought a, one in a quart, I'd probably put it in a, a three quart. What's called a trade gallon, and that'll be great. When it gets bigger, you can move it into a two gallon pot. I, you rarely see any that really need to be in much bigger than a two gallon. Okay. And then just you can, uh, a couple different ways in a pot, you can put it in a pot and put it in a saucer water. That works absolutely fine. You can try it without a saucer water as long as you keep it moist. Uh, we grow them both ways. We've seen absolutely no difference one over the other. Does the depth of a pot make a difference? Doesn't seem to. Because these don't seem yeah. deeply rooted. Right? Yeah. They're just like iris. They're, they're not. They're not deeply rooted at all. And it's a very interesting, yeah, it's, it's the roots got a lot of root hairs. So you definitely do not want to let the roots get dry because those root hairs will die just like that. What about the type of water? Uh-huh. Um, does it need to be rainwater, It's filtered water? It's much best if it's rainwater. You don't want to put anything with salts in it. So chlorine, fluorine are not your friends. So if you've got... Treated water, electric I, rainwater. Yeah, yeah. Or, or let, if you have treated water, let it sit out and let all the salts evaporate and then you're good. But yeah, love rainwater. That's really great. Any other questions? Can I hope. You ever add yeah. in um, like a perlite or sand, or it's always just straight? We, we do straight peat. Now there's some growers that swear you have to grow them in half sand, half yeah. peat. Uh, years ago, when when I worked at the state fair, we had a guy that entered every year, and he had the best pitcher plants of anybody. And I went to him. I said, "What is your secret?" He said, "Straight peat." He said, everybody grows them in all these other mixes. Straight peat is number one. And that's what we've done ever since. And I'm, I'm going to tell you, I've never seen a plant grow as good. 
So unless you just have some sand you want to get rid of, straight peas. It's just, it's just, it's, it's too easy. I think people a lot of times want to make things more complicated than they are. And these are insanely easy, but yet if I read some of the instructions that I see, oh, I just, yeah, I, I just give up. It's like, you got to, well, no, you don't. Get a pot, get a bed, put some peat moss in it and plant it and leave it. It's, it's really that simple. And so, yeah, I, th I think a lot of people have got scared away, but, but I really do hope people will enjoy this. And come back and see it in July and September when the pitchers really grow. Now, typically, look, one more thing, pitchers typically grow in spring and in fall. They do not grow in the summer or very few new pitchers. But once you hit late August, you get a whole new flush of pitchers that are often even taller than the spring pitchers. And it's really amazing. So our September open house, the, the flush of pitchers for that is just, it's just absolutely splendid. So you're just seeing it now with the baby pitchers, but these things uh, are just, just really pretty neat. And so there's, there's no need to, to gather them out of the wild. They're so easy to propagate. Uh, now, they are promiscuous in the garden. If we gather seed out here, which we do, they are crossing with everything. I mean, they love to cross with each other. So we grow them up, and after about two years, you can start making selections, and you get some really cool stuff when you have this many growing together. But again, I, I hope this helps you to realize how easy and how great these are to grow. And take a look. We just redid our big pitcher plant bog down in the Woodland Garden. Take a look at that. And go over here in the, uh, the area across the road, and you will see we just tucked them in among other perennials. And they've been in now for probably six years over there and do absolutely fabulous. So seems to me they won't spread if I put them too many in one pot. Should I put single specimens in a pot? They, they will strike it. So this was, this was one division. Uh -huh. So it will spread to that in about three to four years. And then we can separate them and do something. Easy to separate. Okay. Absolutely easy. So there is no wrong because you just take them right and they don't, they don't miss a beat when you transplant them. So, yeah, you can put them, you can combine them. The key, as I was mentioning earlier, is any container, you want to have a hole in the side of the container about two inches below the ground level. That is critical. You can use a pot with no drainage as long as you have side holes. Below ground level now. About two you're, inches. You're planting the pot. Can we leave the pot out? Uh, outside in out the winter? The no, I'm sorry. Just out of the ground in the summer. In the summertime, yes, as long as you keep them watered. Visit. Yeah. Yeah, we have some pots up here in, in front of this house. that They're in big ceramic pots. They've been out for 15 years, and they stay out all winter. Now, if you get much below zero, I'd probably bring them in on those nights. But absolutely, you can grow so them in the pot. Side holes in the pots if they're outside. If it's a, no, if it's a terracotta no, pot. No, you always need side holes. That is, always, if okay. unless you have bottom holes. Now, if you have bottom holes, you're fine. Oh yeah, the, with the saucer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have a saucer and bottom holes, you're fine. But a lot of people like to put them in pots that have no drainage. Oh, okay. no, then they drown. Yeah, yeah, okay. right. Yeah, then you have to do the side holes. But yes, as long as you have bottom holes, you're absolutely fine. Yeah, do these produce pheromones that uh, attract the insects to the fishes? Uh, they do produce a, uh, a chemical attractant uh, that brings them in. It's very interesting. There have been studies done that said, are the same insects that pollinate it the same insects it eats? And the answer was no. Which it's probably good because you wouldn't live real long if you were killing off your pollinators. So it was a really neat study that, uh, that, that showed that totally different insects come in and pollinate it. And generally it's things like wasp and yellow jackets, some flies, but really wasp and yellow jackets are the biggest thing that it consumes. Well, that's another reason to grow on. Huh? <laughs> yes, exactly. They really, it's, it's quite amazing to watch. And if you sit by one for probably five minutes, you're going to see insects going in. It's, it's absolutely amazing how many it captures.